I remember we were traveling once by flight and they were calling out for a doctor. And we had just gone over the English Channel and we were passing over London and the UK. So what are the four most common things that happen on an airline where a person's health gets affected? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I've said it again and again and again. It's great to you know, uh, take all the precautions, then be on the flight and be in trouble. If you know you're at risk, don't fly. Hey guys. Hi guys. Today we're gonna be talking about in-flight medical emergencies. Oh. The kind of things where they call for the doctor. So join us, it's gonna be very interesting. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Nene, a US trained cardiac, thoracic, and vascular surgeon, and a general surgeon. As a healthcare innovator and a health tech innovator, I wanna empower you to your best health ever. On this channel, we will share evidence-based medicine from all of us to you through our experiences and training about health and healthcare. The goal is to help you make informed decisions about your own health as well as that of your loved ones. We're here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out. I remember we were traveling once by flight and they were calling out for a doctor and you and there was another doctor on board who was not actually, he was a psychiatrist. And so you were the only ones who, you know, were there on the flight and then you took over. Uh, you went and saw the lady, he had to uh, put an IV in her and she had fainted and you know, they had to divert the flight and we went somewhere else, right? Uh, that's a big problem because you know, when a flight gets diverted, they have to dump the fuel and you have to kind of manage everything. Uh, that Would you like to talk about what happened? Yeah, so we were on a flight back from India and we were flying from Frankfurt to Denver where we lived and it was a 10 hour flight. And we had just gone over the English Channel and we were passing over London and the UK and a call went up that they needed a doctor and um, as always, I raise my hand and see what all I can do. And there's some things which I'm uniquely qualified to do and other things which I'm not the expert in. But I asked them what, what seems to be the nature of the medical emergency. And they said, look, there's only two people on this plane who've responded. It's been you and a retired psychiatrist. And we've got a lady who was an uh, American tourist from Wisconsin. And she was in Tunisia, and she developed horrendous diarrhea and nausea and vomiting and had not been able to eat for four days. Stands to reason why they allowed her on the flight, but I guess they didn't know. In any case, she had fainted in the uh, bathroom and she wasn't able to get up and she was unconscious. So I went back to take a look at her and the thing that struck me initially was we were in a hostile environment at 35,000 feet. Uh, the, the plane was shaking because we were in midair, and I'm trying to do an assessment, trying to wake her up, see what her vitals are. And she was literally ashen gray, and she had um, you know, a very thready pulse. So I had to quickly uh, talk to her husband, and he then told me that she wasn't able to take anything down for several days, and they were scared about getting medical care in Tunisia, and so they just wanted to get back home to their own doctor. Probably not the best decision, because they should have used a little bit of an ounce of prevention and gone to the doctor at the airport and gotten cleared. But regardless, now we were in the situation. And so the first thing I had to do was to fish out the medical kit. And I thought that was very interesting, because in, in the U US, with the Federal Aviation Administration, they have certain mandatory things that airlines have to have. But that's not necessarily true everywhere in the world. And those, Mandatory things included uh, automatic external defibrillator um, to cardiovirtue out of strange rhythms. <clears throat> they had uh, everything to do the assessment with stethoscopes and, and otoscopes and blood pressure cuffs. They had everything for IVs, mm -hmm. they had catheters, they had all the basic medications. And it was a pretty complete kit, honestly. So I, I was well trained. I was um, ACLS, BCLS, ATLS, and a heart surgeon. So I'd done all of this before. So I was in a good place for this. And typically, what happens when a medical call goes up is the um, purser will call the pilot, the pilot will call the ground, whichever station they're over, and the airline will try to activate a medical network which they have in place. 
to try to assess it. There's different levels of care. So in some cases, if there's no doctors on board, the basic life-saving, most of the flight attendants have had some exposure to, but this was a little more advanced. Um, and so they said, you know, do you feel comfortable doing this? And I told them, you know, what I do for a living and all that. And they said, okay, doc, you're, we're fine. And so I quickly went and placed an IV, and it was a little difficult because A, her veins were flat. She was completely dehydrated. Um, B, the airline was shaking, and so trying to get an IV into her was yeah, the hardest thing. Tough. Yeah, it was ridiculous. And C, there wasn't good lighting. There wasn't uh, a lot of privacy. I'm sitting in a galley in the back of the plane with a patient. And in many cases, when people faint, um, you can lie them back, bring their legs up, put them into life-saving mm. position, and revive them fairly quickly. In this lady's case, I think she'd been fairly dehydrated, so it was a little difficult. Right. So what are the four most common things that happen on an airline where a person's health gets affected? So that a, can happen it's to a, a person. It's a great question. Right. There was a great paper which reviewed thousands of occurrences over almost 25 years. Hmm. And what they showed with IMEs or in-flight medical emergencies is 30% are due to syncopal episodes, meaning fainting. Um, another 10% or more are from gastroenteritis or gastrointestinal issues, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Hmm. Um, another seven or 8% are from uh, respiratory issues, meaning the difficulty uh, breathing, oxygenation, right. whatnot. And then another seven or eight percent are from cardiac issues, from chest pain, um, or other things related to that. And then within that, um, you can have uh, acute strokes and things like that. The remainder are various other issues. You can have bleeding, you can have things related to um, OBGYN or, or uh, to uh, pregnant women, you can have issues with allergies and yeah. whatnot. But the top 50% is those four things. And in this lady, obviously, we had uh, gastroenteritis and we had a syncopal episode, meaning she fainted. And so we had to quickly get her resuscitated. So in this lady's case, I put an IV in, I ran it wide open, we were able to get back some pressure. There wasn't a lot of help on the plane. There weren't any nurses. And the flight attendants were great at holding the IVs up and helping me with whatever I needed. Uh, and then once we were able to get her a little bit resuscitated and she uh, came back to consciousness, I could get the full history, get her symptoms and all that. And then we basically moved her to a business class seat and isolated her. And then for the remainder of that trip, I was with her. But the key call, and this was the interesting one, mm is the purser and the captain were asking me as we got the, the initial evaluation done and the initial resuscitation whether we needed to divert the flight. And you know, I never thought about this, but when you have a 747 full of fuel, in order to land that 747. They have to dump the fuel. That's right, so 300, 400,000 gallons of jet <clears throat> A over the ocean in order to land. In addition to that, you have almost four or 500 passengers who will have to be diverted, booked, all that. Oh, God. And Nightmare. so it's, it's a, not a small undertaking by any scope, but you do whatever you have to as a physician right. to decide how to save this patient. And in this case, once we got the IV in and resuscitated her, I was pretty comfortable that even eight hours later, we could get her to Denver right. and get her to care and that this was self-limited because she was not having any other critical symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, or any other things. I had given her uh, different medications for the nausea and <clears throat> we were able to get her uh, straightened out that way. And then it was more or less a babysitting job for eight hours. Right, right. So um, I have a question, like who should avoid air travel? It's a who great question. Who are the people question. who should avoid yeah, air so, travel? So we live in an age where you can go from one part of the world to another in hours, not days or weeks or months. Four billion people a year travel on airlines. And what's interesting is that one in 604 flights will have an in-flight medical emergency. And when you look at overall, it can be anywhere from 22 to 140 uh, in-flight medical emergencies per million people traveled. So it's not uncommon at all. 
Now, the, the real question is, are there absolutes on people who should never fly? The answer is yes. In the case of gravid women, meaning women who are pregnant, if you're, it's your first pregnancy and you're over 36 weeks, most doctors would not recommend mm -hmm. flying. Makes sense, right? If you go into labor on a plane, it's oh. the harshest yeah. place to deliver a baby. If you've had more than one baby, and as happens when you have more than one baby, the labor progresses much more quickly, um, you should not fly after 32 weeks. Now, the second class of people are people who have existing chronic or acute illnesses. When I say chronic, it's people who have chest pain, which is unstable. That's an obvious one. If you're having unstable angina, as we call it, you should not be on a plane unless it's a medevac plane with a doctor and you have to be traveling that way because it's foreboding. Now, it's an, let me back up one second that most commercial flights are flying 30 to 40,000 feet in the air and they're pressurized to only six to 8,000 feet. When you look at that, the air is, is air pressure is lower, right? And, and so what happens is in any air-filled cavity, the air is expanding by 30%. So your sinuses, your ears, your, your bowels, all of that take that. Secondly, you have a lower oxygen carrying capacity, meaning that the, the percentage of oxygen in the air will be lower. You're at right. six to 8,000 feet. So in patients who have issues with heart disease or with oxygenation, mm. like uh, emphysema or whatnot, they will be people at risk for having um, problems with oxygenation. And in those cases, you may want to have a prescription for an oxygenator, which will run one and a half times the, the time of the flight. Now, the other things which you worry about are people who have gone diving, right? If you've dove within 12 hours of a flight, you shouldn't be flying on that flight. And if you dove multiple times or with decompression stops, um, you gotta wait at least one day before you get on a flight. And most commercial airlines will say that. The second thing is if you've got a bad cold and your station tubes are plugged or if you are congested, you will end up with an earache or worse, you had a sinus ache. And so those people should not be traveling. So if you're infectious and you have some sort of an infectious disease, well, you should not travel. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, infectious right? is a different thing. You don't want to infect everyone. Yeah. But I'm saying even if you're getting over a cold yeah. and you're not infectious anymore, you will be miserable. Yeah. Um, secondly, if you've got a history of uh, intracerebral pressures in your brain after a brain injury or something like that, which are elevated, those are closed spaces and you can get expansion there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are patients who you wouldn't want to travel. Um, finally, if you've got a um, history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or a history of multiple pneumothoraces where you get ruptures of blebs in your lungs and that hasn't been treated before you go, there is a risk that you could get a pneumothorax. Similarly, if you have bad anemia like sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. some of those patients should not be flying. And then lastly, if you have a history of mental disease where you're in confined spaces or there's issues, that needs to be addressed before you get on board. Because I can tell you uh, a plane is like the last place you want to have a psychotic break. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and thanks for joining us. As always, if you've liked it, hit the like button, subscribe so you can see more of our uh, videos and remember to share this with everyone. And don't forget to leave the comments in the section below so that we know if we're on track and if you have questions. Lastly, as always, I've left great uh, articles and, and um, links for you from where we've gotten the source content. So if you have more questions, let us know. We have purposely kind of made this a little simpler so that everyone can understand it and we can share our experiences. And we're seasoned travelers. But for anyone traveling these days, it's not easy. And the bottom line is we're with you on that journey as well. Anyway, take care. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. See you.